Most anime fans know of the director of Cowboy Bebop, Samurai Champloo, Carol and Tuesday, and many more, Shinichiro Watanabe. However, you may not know about the writer who has been helping him and has worked on many other anime series on her own, Keiko Nobumoto. So today I want to help introduce you guys to her and learn a little bit about her work, her amazing writing skills on some of our most favorite series, her own original anime that she's worked on that, that is critically underrated, and so much more. But before we begin, don't forget to grab your cup because it's time to spill the anime tea. I hate that story. <clears throat> I never liked cats, you know that. Keiko Nobumoto didn't start her career off with Jinichiro Watanabe, but her career did pick up a lot after meeting and working with Watanabe. Everyone's familiar with the critically acclaimed classic anime series, Cowboy Bebop. Nobumoto was not only the head writer for the entire series, as well as overseeing and supervising the tone and writing style of the show, she also wrote 11 of the episodes herself and the movie. She even was responsible for giving Cowboy Bebop its finalized name. According to a quote from Nobumoto herself, she said, I had heard about the song Space Cowboy from an artist, and in my mind, space and cowboy were compatible terms, so it was natural to think of Cowboy Bebop. She pitched it to the rest of the group, and they all agreed, even though it sounded weird at first, and now it is literally a household name. Watanabe and Nobumoto, as we're going to find out a little bit later on in this video, enjoy writing about and creating stories with characters that kind of don't really fit together. There's these trios or these, how would you say a group of more than four people? You wouldn't say quatres. <laughs> a group of kind of misfit people who don't really fit together very well, but end up being together in the same space for a prolonged period of time and having to go through different events together and learning about themselves along the way. Such is the case with Cowboy Bebop, which throws a ragtag group of lots of different people who you wouldn't think get along together. Uh, even the main character, Spike Spiegel, says that he does not like a woman with attitude, he does not like children, and he does not like animals. And that is all that makes up his group on the Bebop throughout the entire show. Something that makes Cowboy Bebop pretty special is that instead of giving exposition and world building and really heavily relying on storytelling to introduce audiences to the world of Cowboy Bebop, they instead rely on how the characters react in whatever situation that they're thrown into, usually ones that make them uncomfortable or that they're not used to, seeing how they approach one person versus another and all kinds of really in-depth character details that we're not used to seeing being the focal point of a lot of anime. For example, in the first episode of Cowboy Bebop, written by Nobumoto herself, we get introduced to Spike Spiegel, but not in a exposition-y internal dialogue type of way, which we're used to seeing in a lot of anime, especially newer anime. From Spike's action throughout that first episode, we learn that he's a bounty hunter, that he believes and trusts in fortune tellers, and that he trusts women a little too easily. This is all learned through the conversations that he has with various people throughout the show. Everything plays out as if we're living the day as Spike Spiegel in his world, which is how good writing should be. <laughs> it should feel like we're just in their world, in the character's world, as they're experiencing things and as they're going throughout their stories. But Nobumoto also proves that she can handle flashbacks and backstories and give a little bit of context and world building through the characters as well. In episode 15, where we focus on Faye's backstory and her life, Faye gets reminded of a person from her past by looking at Ayn and then goes into this entire flashback where we see that she was reawakened from a cryogenic sleep and then has to pay off her debts, ends up falling in love with this guy who ends up being a con artist who puts all his debts on her. The seamless transition from the flashback to the present where the person comes back and Faye finally gets to confront him and ask more questions, even though she doesn't end up with answers to her questions, she just ends up to more questions. Sets it up perfectly for a future episode where we get to see a little bit more about Faye's backstory as well. And of course, in the final two episodes of Cowboy Bebop, Nobumoto wrote both of them, keeping with the tone and the approach of being in the character's shoes. We are still in Spike's shoes and we are finally finishing his story. All the other characters that he interacted with along the way are not around anymore and he now has to go fight his final battle on his own, being changed by the interactions that he has with the people around him and closing off his own story. And of course, we get his famous lasting final words. Bang. For Nobumoto's writing in Cowboy Bebop, you can not only see how passionate she was about 
breaking down the stories and backgrounds of each of the individual characters that she worked on in the show, but also when the groups are together and how they interact with each other. According to Nobumoto herself in an interview, she said, I like it when the group is fully assembled on the bebop for scenes of ordinary life. I also love Spike's attitude when he goes through a stress stressful situation. He always keeps his calm and jokes in a quirky way with the circumstances. It's those kind of little things that I like. So the little interactions between the members in the group, how they react to each other, and how Spike responds to situations, that's different than how most people would respond. Usually he's more joking, funny and lighthearted, and uh, usually whistling some kind of tune. Adding in those little moments in a character really makes them feel three-dimensional and makes us get really wrapped up in their world. Of course, Cowboy Bebop wasn't the only anime that Nobumoto worked on. She also worked on an episode for Carol and Tuesday. Actually, my very favorite episode, episode 15, when Carol and Tuesday go to meet Desmond, who is a paralyzed singer who may be on the verge of death. Probably one of the prettiest, saddest episodes in the entire series. That to this day, when I think about it, makes me want to cry. Like they just had such beautiful moments. There is beautiful dialogue from Desmond themselves talking about uh, the fleeting feeling of life and love and how uh, music connects everyone in the world to one another. And of course, Nobumoto wrote a couple episodes for the other infamous series, Samurai Champloo, Cowboy Bebop's little brother, as people like to call it. She also wrote one of my favorite episodes in Cowboy Bebop as well during this kind of turning point in the middle of the series on episode 16. The trio of characters, Fu, Mugen, and Jean, are kind of finding themselves at a crossroads with each other, not really understanding where they're coming from um, and why they are doing the things that they're doing, why they're on the mission to find the sunflower samurai. So they find themselves splitting off and we get a little bit of backstory, a little bit of their past, a little glimpse of their past in each of them. We get to see Fu, we get to see Mugen, and we get to see Jean, each dealing with different diverging paths in their lives. On top of that is this motif that kind of fits between episode 16 and 17, where they talk about losing the past, and they also have, bring in a character who represents a culture in Japan that is from the past, that is kind of being erased from the culture. So the mix of confronting not only our main character's past, but the past of Japan itself all culminates beautifully together in this first lead-up episode to a two-part series within the show. That again is my favorite part of the entire show, that those two episodes are so beautiful and just really real, like letting go of the past and having to move on into the future. Plus that song in episode 17, my favorite song ever, like in, ever, in any anime ever. Let's move on. Nobumoto didn't only give all of her hard work and talents to Shinichiro Watanabe or his works, however, she also gave it to another great and famous director that many anime fans know and love. But before I get to that, make sure you like this video. If you're enjoying it so far, let me know in the comments if you'd like to learn more about some maybe not so famous writers, but should be famous writers behind some of your favorite anime series. Let's talk about Keiko Nobumoto and Satoshi Kon. <laughs> Nobumoto co-wrote one movie with Satoshi Kon, uh, Tokyo Godfathers, which is praised for its realism and its hard focus on the struggles of three homeless people who actually end up being heroic in their own ways when they are thrown into a situation where a young baby uh, kind of falls into their laps and they have to help find that baby at home. Again, with a focus on a trio or a group of misfit people who kind of don't belong with each other, but also don't really belong in their society as well. And a huge focus on human kindness and the human condition. Hey, Invisible Future Phoenix here. Uh, I watched Tokyo Godfathers the movie after recording this video so that I can come back and talk about it later. So here I am talking about it later. I wanted to talk about how I love that the child in the film represents different facets of life that each character is missing. For Gin, it's his daughter. For Hana, as a trans woman who's always wanted a child, she is a child for her to take care of. Um, and for Miyuki, who's a runaway teenager, it's missing the love of her family. I also love that everything in the movie is so coincidental. Every event that takes place is either just happens by chance or is something 
that comes about because of a character's action. And that feels very much like a Nobumoto sequence of events for her characters. Like I mentioned before in Bebop and other shows, she really focuses on how character actions drive a story. And that is very well exemplified in Tokyo Godfathers. So I think Kohn and Nobumoto did a great job with that, as well as contrasting the lightheartedness of the coincidences against the deeper messages of choosing your family and rejection and second chances that Tokyo Godfathers really emphasizes. And of course, I can't talk about Nobumoto without mentioning her original work, Wolf's Rain. Anyway, it's been fun. If it's meant to be, I hope we'll meet again. It's one of my favorite series that I that I snuck into my sister's room to watch at night on Toonami. It, it didn't make any sense why, like, me as a 10-year-old was so, like, attracted to this series about wolves and sadness and depression and the world falling apart, but it spoke to me somehow. Not only was Nobumoto the creator for the series, she was also the head writer. Similar to Bebop, we follow a kind of bigger group of characters, misfits, that kind of find their way together. The main difference is that they're wolves and that the world is ending. Basically, a small group of wolves that can turn into people and are left in a world full of humans, and the humans are basically destroying the world. And these group of wolves are looking for a way to paradise, which is a place that is promised only to wolves so that they can escape, like, the struggles and terrible things that humanity has done. It's a really deep introspection on like just society and nature and all that. But more importantly than all that, it really focuses on the condition of the characters, the wolves themselves, what they're searching for, what their paradise means to them along the way, and who they end up being and who they are. I think that Wolf's Reign is even more character driven than Cowboy Bebop is because the story and the world building and the setting is a lot more ambiguous and the audience learns a lot about the entire world entirely through the dialogue of the characters, which can be really cryptic and can take a lot to break down. But once you kind of are understanding how each of the characters talks, specifically the main character, Kiba, you kind of understand what um, their purpose is and what they are searching for. I couldn't find any direct quotes from Nobumoto about Wolf's Reign in any interviews, unfortunately, but I did find a quote from the director of Wolf's Reign, which was Tensai Okamura, who talked about how uh, Nobumoto had a certain sense of what the characters wanted and what they were searching for in the show. He says, well, I was the director on Wolf's Reign, but the story writer was Keiko Nobumoto. However, I'm not sure if we had a very full communication about all that. When Nobumoto-sen wrote the story, she was sort of intrigued by the two different aspects of wolves, being noble, you know, the dignified existence of wolves and folklore, and the very violent character of real wolves, and how it's a conflicting characterization. And you can see throughout the show, throughout the characters, their conflicting ideals and concepts of being being good versus bad and violence versus action, as well as just the overlying message of that in the society with the nobles and the regular people of the world. <laughs> Throughout these different examples that I gave for Nobumoto, you can see that she really has a focus on taking characters outside of their usual areas to show audiences a completely new side to them, making them uncomfortable to see parts of them that you wouldn't see uh, when they're in situations where they feel totally in control. Also just fleshing out and creating 3D realistic and relatable characters that struggle and live and breathe and do things that real humans do. And of course, letting characters' actions in various settings and circumstances define who they are rather than letting exposition or world building or some other external factor tell the audience who they should be or who what they are like. Overall, Nobumoto is a fantastic writer. She is one of my personal favorite influences for writing, and I look to her writing and her sense of dialogue and character creation and, and bringing together misfit characters in my own work. And I hope that you do too. If you're a writer and you are and you love anime and you love anything writing. Hey y'all, if you're listening to this on the podcast episode, I wanted to quickly just come in and add that I edited this video, this recording, before I found out about 
Keiko Nobumoto passing away. Um, I just found out a few days ago before pushing this out. So I'm adding this on so that you can hear a little bit about how personally Nobumoto's works really influence me. Um, there are many great articles out there right now, especially the Anime News Network one called The Humanist Legacy of Keiko Nobumoto. And it just really explores her work in more depth. So if you want more information about her, her work, her individual works, and kind of like her story and her start, please go read that article. I'll, I'll link it in the description for both the video and the podcast episode. But I just want to say that Nobumoto really inspired me to become a writer. And the whole reason that I wanted to make a video about her in the first place is because I found out about her work and her character-driven stories and her willingness to like really talk about characters and people and reveal their vulnerabilities in her works. There's not very much of that a lot in anime or in storytelling even today. So I really connected with that. Um, one of my all-time favorite series is Wolf's Reign. That's why I have a whole section of it on this video. And th that probably was a starting point for me to fall in love with like writing and anime and everything that uh, I talk about now. So just remember, I just want people to remember her for her work and like really think about the dialogue and what she was able to create with the characters in each of the works that she contributed to. Yeah, you'll just die. Possibly everyone's going to die. It's a natural part of life. But if life has no purpose, you're dead already. <laughs> 